He is Lord, He is Lord. He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father in heaven, as we begin our journey through the epistle to the Hebrews, guide our hearts and our minds to the fulfilling of your purpose. Help us never to turn back, but to remain focused, steadfast, always abounding in your work and in your labor. We ask you that you will strengthen us more and more day by day. Help us to be strengthened by you so that the world will not squeeze us into its mold, but rather our lives will be fashioned by you as we move forward to your eternal kingdom. Now come and anoint our lips, our hearts, our minds, that all that we think, say, and do now may be done to the honor and glory of your name, the building up of your kingdom, the edification of us as your people, and more importantly, that we may become servants to the servants of God. Have your way within our lives, O oh God. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to do a quick recap of the introduction that I led you through last week so that you can bear in mind what are the challenges that we face when it comes to the epistle to the Hebrews. The epistle to the Hebrews was probably written to a Christian community within Asia Minor. And it is written to a community that faces pressures from without and also pressures from within. From without, there are those who we know are being challenged by the authorities and by the predominantly Gentile population that is steadily beginning to recognize the fact that there's a difference between those of the Jewish faith and those who are Christians. And so you have the pressure from without being applied to them. Secondly, there is a pressure within, and that is that there are some persons who may have been originally Jews who converted to Christianity, but when persecution broke out, some of them decided that, hey, you know something? It's easier for us to go back to our old religion, practice our old ways, keep our sacrifices, make sure that we do all the things we used to do before in terms of Judaism. And the author literally has to say to them, stop people. To go back, you're going back to the shadowy existence. Jesus is the real thing. You cannot turn back. At the same time, he has those who are struggling with their faith because they somehow do, can't, they're not able to make the connection between what Jesus did and what he came to do for them in terms of establishing them in the pathway that led to salvation. And so they have difficulties in understanding imageries out of the Jewish scriptures. On Sunday past, I don't know, uh, there might be some copies of the sermon that I preached on Sunday morning. The Jewish Bible or the Tanakh would have been the scriptures from which Jesus would have taught his disciples in order for them to see how he fulfilled not just the law of Moses, but the Psalms and the material out of the wisdom literature as well. I believe there's some cheats in the back. All I'll do is go in the back while you all read the first chapter and see if I could find them. Thank you. But I want you to understand that for a lot of Gentiles, this was something brand new for them. 
And so it was difficult for them to understand some of the imagery and the language that is placed within the Christian tradition that most Jews would have been comfortable with. And so they needed someone to guide them and help them in terms of understanding their faith and from whence it came and what it is that Jesus actually fulfilled in the process. I hope I'm not losing you all because I want you all to understand that for many of those Gentile Christians, this was brand new to them. And so they needed to know what were the foundational blocks that they needed to hold to. Were you able to find them in the back there? You found some? Sunday pass. Some people move them Sunday night. All right, but what I want you to know is that you have these three different levels and three different forms of really uncomfortableness in terms of the whole community of faith. And at the end of the day, the writer really has to stress the fact that Jesus is the real thing. When we deal with chapter one and chapter two, it would appear that for some people, they believe that Jesus was an angel. And the author has to spend the whole first chapter saying, no, he's not an angel. He is the absolute imprint of God. In other words, he is God incarnate. He, as you're going to see, is defined. And he goes through seven ways of counteracting this whole idea that Jesus was an angel. And I hope that you all are able to follow along. So please, when we read in through chapter one, open up your notepad. I believe it's on page four. Make sure you follow on page four in your notes and it will give you a clear breakdown of why Jesus is not an angel. He is God in human flesh and he comes to make the way of salvation known to us as we journey along the way. You found some? The one mark sermon for sermons notes for the third Sunday of Easter. I think Sai found some. Yeah, that's it. That's the one you need. This one. I put that out for you all because people have been asking me about the new birth um, and, and explaining what does it mean to be born again. Okay? But in this particular set of notes that I produce on Sunday, I did a complete breakdown of 44 prophecies that are fulfilled by Jesus in the pages of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. All right, somebody need a copy? Everybody has a copy? Hmm? You have yours. As I mentioned to you all last class, there are some people who have argued for Apollos being the author of this epistle. And again, I remind you that that is still up in the air. We have a whole lot of people who want to apply it to Paul. They want to say it's Barnabas. There's some people who say it's Clement of Alexandria. It's Clement of Rome. And it's still being debated to this very day on who the author happens to be. Yes? Use the microphone, Nathan. I can't hear you. Follows 
Hold, hold the microphone. Exactly. It had to have been somebody who was very much acquainted with the Jewish Tanakh, as well as someone who obviously was acquainted with basic Christian teaching. And so we need to make sure that we understand that all of that is a part of the process. Okay? Um, and that this, obviously this person knows not only the Jewish scriptures, they know the rituals that are involved, they know the role of the high priest, they know the function within the sanctuary in terms of the sacrificial system, and they also are very much acquainted with Jewish traditions. And they obviously use them to point out how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those things at the end of the day. He is a greater high priest than the one who goes to make a sacrifice year after year. And we are told that later on when we come to chapter 3 and chapter 4, chapter 5 as well. So basically, I pointed out to you all that Apollos is probably the one who is writing the passage. The book is probably written near the end of the first century of the church's existence. And more importantly, they're trying to make sure that they ground people in their faith and tell them, uh, you can't go back. Jesus is the real thing. Don't waste your time trying to go back so you could find some, what I call, comfortable religion. And I hope you write that expression down somewhere because it is a problem. When Christians look for comfortable religion, you are courting trouble. It happens today, don't Of course. Yeah. When you're looking for comfortable religion, you set yourself up for problems. So please, people, be careful. I tell people all the time, Jesus is the real thing. Um, we try to get into philosophy now, into psychology, into so many other disciplinary dis dis disciplines without us really getting to the heart of the issue, and that is that Jesus still remains the core. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? I've given you a breakdown, a breakdown of the epistle on pages two and three out of your notes, and I hope and pray that you all will spend time making sure that you make your way through it as best as you possibly can. I believe that the person who's going to read chapter one for us is here. First chapter Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become a much superior, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son? Today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be your, his father, and he will be my son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says that all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. 
You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you have founded the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like clothing, like a cloak. You will roll them up. And like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand, until I, have you, uh, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Honor all angel spirits in the divine service, sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. The word of the Lord. Oh, they, they, they want a copy of the notes. Yes. Okay, I will send it when I get home to everybody. Okay? So that they can get them. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I should tell you what, what they're referring to. On Sunday, I did, when Jesus meets his disciples, um, after he greets the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they dash back to Jerusalem. And while they're giving their witness in Jerusalem, Jesus appears to the other disciples who are all gathered there. He says, peace be with you. And then they're terrified. And he shows them his hands, his side. He asks for something to eat. And then he had to open their mind to the scriptures. And so what happened is that I produced this little leaflet to show them what possible scriptures. Oh, somebody gave it to you. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll just send it to the people who are on the internet so that they're able to have it. Those who are not here. Okay. The, this epistle does not start off like St. Paul's epistles. If you go back, St. Paul's epistles always start with those familiar words of Paul, and then he tells them about himself, I'm a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, and then he starts to call the names of the people who he's addressed the epistle to, and all the rest of it, and peace be to you, and all the usual greetings and all the rest of it. This, however, does not start off like that. It starts off more like a sermon. And so a lot of people refer to it as a sermon. So please make a note of that, that you really have what is being preached here to an entire congregation. And I remind you all that when epistles arrived, people would come and say, we just got a letter from Paul and the congregation would sit down and they would read it from start to finish. Hello? Some of y'all could only take a little bit from Sunday morning. Imagine if they came and brought a letter with 16 chapters and y'all had to sit down and listen to the 16 chapters being read. Huh? They do all one, at one sitting? At one sitting. Well, that's what they did with the law. And the prophets, what they did is they made sure. They made sure that everybody got it all in one sitting. And so we need to make sure that we understand that. Let's go on. I believe that what is key for you is to understand that in the opening verses, it says God in the past spoke through the prophets. Their revelation is only partial. But in these last days, he has spoken through his son. Okay? And the key verse here, please mark it in your own Bibles, not the church Bibles, please. 
is verse 3, where it says, He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. In other words, Jesus is the reflection of God's glory. And he is the exact imprint of God's very being. And the only way that could happen is for Jesus to be what? He has to be God, the same as God. All right? So please make sure you write that down somewhere. What's happening is that he's describing to us that the Jesus that we know is the exact imprint of God's glory and his being. And I want you to write a little note to a, next to it. God can never stop being God. Okay? And the English language could do some serious damage when it comes to the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? Not like the New World Translation that says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's the Jehovah Witness Bible. That's not our Bible. Our Bible makes it clear that Jesus is God. Okay? Yesterday, today, and forever. You get the picture, everybody? And what the author is trying to start off from the very beginning is telling us that Jesus spoke powerfully to God's purpose and plan for humanity. And it is Jesus who has achieved the pathway for salvation for us. Not an angel, but Jesus. And Jesus alone. You have the picture, everybody? And he wants to make sure that we understand that he is more than what people are trying to describe him as, as an angel. So he gives seven quotes. Seven quotes. Five of them from the Psalms and two from Samuel and Deuteronomy. The first one you should know at the baptism. You remember that? At the baptism, what did the voice say? Today have I begotten you. And it comes from Psalm 2, verse 7. And Psalm 2, verse 7 was usually read as a new king was about to begin a new reign. Okay? And so it tells us that not only is Jesus the son, but he's also the king. He's also the one who's ushering in the new kingdom. He's the one who's about to begin a new reign. He is the one who is going to establish God's people to make us royalty at the end of the day. The second quote comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. I will be father to him, and he shall be a son. And again, it was to prove the eternal and continuous status of the son. I have heard people, even preachers, talk about the fact that Jesus left his divinity behind in heaven. There's no such thing, people. Please write it down on your paper somewhere. Jesus did not leave his divinity behind in heaven. He carried and brought it to this earth. In other words, there is no separation between the two. You get the picture, everybody? 
And please don't let people lead y'all astray. Why? Why would they say that? They would say that because it makes life easier. They would say that because what they're trying to do is make life easier for them in terms of explaining what Jesus came to do. If he leaves his divinity behind and simply becomes human, then everything that happens can be explained from a human perspective. Okay? And the problem with that is very simple. I tell people all the time, when you take away Jesus' divinity and just think of him as being nothing more than a man, then we fall to the trap of Islam, of so many of the other religions of the world that treat Jesus as though he was just a teacher, just a prophet, just a regular human being. In other words, he had to work hard and then God allowed him to progress and promoted him up to becoming the son of God. And I have a problem with that because it's known as, in, in theological terms, it is known as subordination. In other words, you're, you're starting off with a human Jesus who has to work hard and promote himself. And what it does is tell, it tells the rest of humanity, listen, you know what? You could become just like Jesus, just work hard enough. <laughs> and you'll be just like him. Yes, go ahead. Has that been any bearing on how Jesus treats his disciples and the problems that he's never seen If you look at the sheet that I did for Sunday Pass, it says that one of the predictions is from out of the book of Isaiah, where it says that he would speak to them in parables. And the whole purpose behind the parable is for them to be able to identify with something or someone in the parable. Those were stories about ordinary life and what our lives could become in the kingdom of God. When we were growing up, many of us were told parables are earthly stories with what? Exactly. And unfortunately, that is not, that is not an accurate description of parables. Parables are stories about ordinary life and what our lives can become if we undergo the necessary transformation to be what God wants us to be. In other words, Jesus wanted us to identify with something or someone in the parable. And where necessary, change course in the grace of God so we could become what God wants us to be. Okay? I hope you write that definition down somewhere so that you'll get You'll never forget it. Parables are stories about ordinary life and what our lives can become in the kingdom of God. Microphone is across here with Dennis and then back over here to Minky. No, no, that Jesus is like God. Less than. Like but like. Like but less than. Less than. In other words, they treat him as a hybrid creature. He's not equal to God and he's less than God, according to Arianism. And that caused us to have the great Council of Nicaea, where they had to decide on the nature and the character of Jesus. So when we stand up to say the creed on a Sunday morning, um, and we have been saying the Apostles' Creed, I've been trying to get my, my curator to realize that we need to say both creeds, because the Nicene Creed really lays out for us that he is true God of true God, okay? that we need to understand that we cannot downplay the nature and the character of Jesus. He is true God of true God, true man of, um, and we need to, no, no, hold on, sorry, over here to Minky. 
and we must never downplay who Jesus happened to be. That's one of the reasons why when you make the sign of the cross, you hold your two fingers, the three up here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the two fingers at the bottom represent perfect God and perfect man. What's that, Dennis? No, no, this. Yeah, you could get it. You put three fingers together, your thumb and the two fingers, and then the two at the bottom. Yeah, the two at the bottom. <laughs> Mickey. So it seems that we should, when I say we, our preachers should learn that Jesus applied the parables to everyday living mm -hmm. so that we can understand that we, how we, the mistakes we make in everyday living and gives us a way out to improve ourselves. And a lot of our priests don't understand that part, but they sometimes they will preach on the level where we can understand and uh, realize our mistakes and move the higher level. Well, the problem as I see it, and I'm going to say this to you, one of the biggest stumbling blocks in what I would call um, the established religious orders, and right, talking about Roman Catholics, Anglicans, uh, Presbyterians, Lutherans, is that when a lot of their people go off to train for ministry, they get so deep into the books that they believe that those six feet off the ground when they stand up to preach is supposed to be six feet above contradiction. In other words, they must sound intelligent, they must do all the intelligent stuff, and half of the time it just pshoo, over the top of people's heads without them ever capturing the essence of the gospel message. I really believe, and this has always been my belief, that when we send people off for theological training, I had a professor used to say something that stuck with me all my life. He said to me, Basil, it takes all the theology in the world to keep things simple for your people. You get the point, Binky? Yeah. In other words, don't make it so complex that you lose people. I've heard people talk about parables only having one point. And I tell them that that's not true. Because when I read the parables, I see that there are several avenues and ways that Jesus is reaching out through the parables to touch other people's lives. And there are people being identified or identifying with something or someone in the parable. And therefore, you need to be able to recognize the fact that Jesus really wanted them to understand it. That's what made them so angry when he got to the end of his ministry. When Jesus started to tell some of those parables and the Pharisees realized, they, he talked about us. They were upset and they were angry. All right? And yet Jesus was trying to tell them, there has to be a change. There has to be some transformation that has to take place. And I think one of the biggest problems we face is that there are people who get caught up in what I call in these theological gymnastic sermons that are so high that people forget. I'll share, I'll share a story with you that happened to me when I was at St. George's. Um, at that time, the Bishop of Jamaica, God rest his soul, came and preached a powerful, a powerful, what I would call strong theological sermon. Now, except for the priest who was sitting down there, the poor people in the congregation, they had no idea what the bishop was trying to say. And so when we finished church and we were standing up in the sacristy, he said, Basel, I, I get the impression that your people didn't understand what I was trying to say. 
And then I said to him, well, I had a wise professor who always said to me, uh, it takes all the theology in the world to keep things simple for your people. And he said, ah, oh, I learned something today. The following Sunday, he came back. And when he finished preaching, the people in St. George's got up. And they applauded because the word hit home. They were able to identify with what he was saying. And it made sense for them. And I really believe that that's what the word should do. And I'm not talking about turning into games and the rest of it. I, I, these people who are doing a whole lot of funny stuff these days, I, 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 that's not necessary. I think the word itself should have an impact on people's lives. And I can tell you right now, there are some people who can respond favorably to the word, and there are some people who can be mad. and bent right out of shape. But you are not going to get the same response from everybody. But the word needs to be declared properly and in a way so that people are able to understand without all the heretical stuff. You know, um, theological colleges are famous for dismantling the faith of persons who come to them. So they get them to speculate, what if they find Jesus' body. What if there was no resurrection? What if? And I tell them, all that nonsense and that rubbish y'all go through, instead of building up people's faith so that they're able to share something that will put them on a solid foundation, because they have to go back to people who are looking for a solid foundation. They are not looking for what if. They're looking for surety, assurance, to know exactly what's happening in terms of their faith journey. Where am I going to spend eternity? Don't tell me about no what if. Okay? And I believe that in a real sense, we are called at every turn and step along the way to make sure that we definitely put people on the solid rock for their salvation, not on shifting sands. I hope that helps. Okay. Let's go through the rest of them. The quote, the next quote comes from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43. Again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, refers to the birth of Jesus and the heavenly hosts. When remember the angels were praising God and rejoicing, glory to God in the highest and peace to persons on the earth. Remember that? The fourth quote comes from Psalm 104. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angel wings and um, winds and his ministers flames of fire. And yet the only begotten son fulfills the role aptly for both angels and mortals. Fifth quote from Psalm 45, verse 6. It says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. In other words, God has appointed you above his fellows and once again he uses this to show the superiority of the son who reigns forever and ever the sixth quote comes from psalm 102 where it says "O lord thou in the beginning this lay the foundations of the earth and it says "O lord let me tell you right now it's describing jesus yet again and then psalm 110 is the last psalm that he uses um, it is an enthronement psalm, again, that is read when the king is about to begin a new reign and establish a new kingdom. Um, and he talks about what angel did God ever say, come sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He never said that to anybody, but he said it to Jesus because Jesus becomes the king of kings and the Lord of lords who brings everything under subjection to himself. You've seen that subjection already. Um, in our Bible study. You've seen it in several places. You've seen it in the passage from Ephesians chapter 1. Write it down so you all can keep a track of some of these things. Ephesians chapter 1, where it says, he brought everything under subjection to him. Ephesians chapter 4, 
where it says that he filled the whole universe with his presence. You see it in the reading that we had for the day from Acts chapter 7. When Stephen is stoned, Stephen literally says to them, I see him standing at the right hand of God. And that's not a position, but rather it is the place of honor and high favor, which tells us that just as the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 was supposed to stand at the right hand of God and establish his kingdom forever, Jesus has gone ahead of us. He's done that. He's being there. That's what made them so angry because Stephen literally says to them, you all here playing the fool, Jesus is already up in heaven. And he's already taken his rightful place. He's in charge. And that's why they put their hands over their ears, stamped up and down, grabbed hold of Stephen. And when they stone people within the biblical tradition, I need you to understand, people, they took you to the highest point on the city wall. They threw you over. If you survived the fall, they came down with rocks to finish the job. Mm -hmm. Dead serious. Okay? And pray to God you weren't like a, a particular family who decided they were going to hide they were going to hide the gold and the silver and all the rest of the stuff under the tent after they hit the, um, after the fall of Jericho that caused the children of Israel to lose the battle against Ai. Because they went inside of there, they not only took the family out, they took the daddy out, the mummy out, the children out, the grandchildren out, all their animals, all their creatures. They stoned them all to death. They threw wood on top of them and burned them. And then when they finished doing that, they stoned them again. Make sure they did. But, but you got to realize in the Old Testament, there was a simple rule. The only way you could get rid of the sin was to kill the sinner. Thank God we live in grace here. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Kill all of us, boy. You all probably would have been dead. All right? But the whole point of the passage is this. Do not degrade the Savior and deliverer of God's people and make him lower or on the same level as the angels, because he's not even in their category at all. He is God. God incarnate. And I hope you write it down somewhere just like that. God incarnate means God in human flesh. God in human flesh. And that's going to become very important for us. Someone's supposed to read chapter 2. Nathan? I just got to adjust the microphone for you. Hmm? That's high enough for... Letter to the Hebrews, chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message is declared to the angels of knowledge, Every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty. How can we escape it if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first to the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him. But God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. 
Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to, to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we, as it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, for, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because of the suffering of death, so that by grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, from whom and to whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all love one father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will, I will proclaim you your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am. I am the children whom God has given me. Since, there, since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over death. That is the devil. And free, and free those who are, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but descendants of Abraham. Therefore we are to become like his brothers and sisters in every aspect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He is able to help those who are being tested. Word of God. Okay, when we look at chapter 2, if the message given by angels was heeded, he basically says, how much more we need to heed the gospel message? That's the real punch line here. And he's trying to say, listen, we need to sit up, pay attention. If the message declared through angels was valid and every transgression or disobedience receive a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first through the Lord and was attested to us by those who heard him while God added, to his, added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles. In other words, he's saying that the word was declared by the apostles, the disciples, those followers of Jesus, and signs and wonders follow them. And by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will, the kingdom of God spread, and the good news reached far and wide. Now, God did not subject the world, the subject, the coming world about which we are speaking. The angels, but someone has justified somewhere. It says, What are human beings that you are what? Or models that you care for them? You made them a little lower than the angels, so you could do what? Crown them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Yes, Nathan. You have the microphone. Uh, 
I'm a good lawyer, and he says, I'll come on to the lawyer, come on, honey. And he said, well, what would the word say? I don't see it. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm here. For the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all the rest of it. In other words, God made us to be the real rulers over his created order and to be responsible for it. Remember, we were supposed to be the caregivers, the caretakers at the end of the day. And so what he's literally saying is that Jesus came to this world in order to make sure that he carried us back to where we needed to be. And I always tell people, when you look at Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, they did four things. First thing they did was they distorted the image of God in us so that we couldn't carry on, act, and behave like we were the children of God. We were created in God's image and likeness. What does that mean? It means that we were created to reflect God's attributes, his character, his nature, his name, his values in this world. The second thing that they did is that they allowed sin to enter the picture for the first time. Up to that point, remember, God kept on saying, and it was good. It was very good. Remember that? And Adam and Eve, by their sin, allowed sin to come into the whole picture for the first time. The third curse that they brought, because of sin, it brought death. St. Paul tells us that. He says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Okay? So that's what happened. And the fourth and final curse is that humanity was removed from the presence of God. In other words, they were driven out of the garden. They were driven out. Remember that? At the end of chapter 3? That was the final thing that happened to them. And what God has done through Jesus is began that whole process of redeeming us, carrying us back to God's original state and his original plan so that we could exercise the kind of authority he wanted from us from the very beginning. Okay? So when it says here that he made them a little lower than the angels in order to crown them with glory and honor, God had his plan in place. He knew exactly what he was doing. He says, what we've seen, we've seen it all take place. Jesus has reversed all those curses. By his incarnation, he's restored the image of God in us. By his death on the cross, he has dealt with our sins. By his resurrection, he has dealt with the problem of our death. That graveyard is not your rest, the final resting place. God has something better in store for you in this life. And by his ascension in heaven, which we will celebrate in a couple of weeks' time, which is a high feast day, and unfortunately, I don't know what happened in the Bahamas, but in most of the countries which were once colonies, ascension day was a holiday. Ascension Day was a holiday. Yeah. Huh? No, not with Monday. With Monday is a totally different holiday. Huh? You want that one back now? Eh? It's even in certain parts of Europe. Ascension Day is a holiday. In Jamaica as well. Okay? 40 days after Easter. It's always a Thursday. Okay? Yes, Walden. Hold on. What happened to what happened to after the believers who believed in Jesus? What happened to them when they died? Before Jesus? For them, we know that they went to a shadowy existence. When you look at 
you're asking me to explain the whole concept of life after death. <laughs> All right? And that's going to take a while. But let me give you a brief understanding of what they believed about life after death. When they started off thinking about life after death, everybody went to Sheol. Okay? S H E O L. And Sheol was a shadowy existence that they believed was under the earth. And everybody went there good, bad, the righteous, the unrighteous. Everybody ended up in Sheol. By the time you get, and as the years roll on, the concept and the ideas began to change. And then people began to realize you can't be sending the righteous to that same place that the wicked are going to. That ain't fair. That ain't right. Okay? So by the time you get to the book of Daniel, which is written around about the second century BC, okay, this is about 150, 75 years before Jesus shows up on the scene. They begin to talk about the righteous being raised to life eternal while the wicked are sent to, to literally hell at the end of the day. It is only when you get to the New Testament that you have a full development of the concept of life after death. But even there, you have two concepts which control our understanding of life after death, even for us as Christians. And I hope you write down some of these passages so you can go and check it out for yourself. The first one is that there were some people who believed that Christians literally when they died, went to a, they were kept in a state of almost eternal sleep until the trumpet would sound. So you have passages such as Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 and following, where St. Paul says, I would not have you ignorant, but he says, uh, you know, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and they will meet him in the air, and those of us who are left behind, we will be transformed and will be taken up. There's everything that St. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we have to also grapple with, where he basically spread, spells out what needs to happen, that the perishable cannot take on imperishability. In other words, there has to be some sort of transformation that takes place because God has to change our nature from here to prepare us for eternity. By the time you get to Revelation, which is written near the end of the first century, there was a belief that there were plenty of persons who had already reached heaven in terms of being a part of the eternal crowd that was around the throne of glory. Um, when you get a copy of my book on Revelation, on the last Tuesday in this month, and you begin to read through it, you begin to realize that what is happening is that there is a crowd that is in heaven. And while they have reached heaven, they never stop crying and pleading with God to deal with the saints who are left behind here struggling on the face of the earth. They've already entered into the narrow presence of God and into his glory. And so you have this crowd to sleeping. The crowds are already in the narrow presence of God because they've gained it by their martyrdom and by what they went through in terms of persecution. So you have these concepts being brought up. Even um, Revelation chapter 7 bears that for us as well, um, where they talk about um, 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from that tribe, 12,000 from that tribe, and then the 144,000 from out of the various tribes. And then there's this multitude which no man can number that the author sees as well. Both are designed to tell us that whoever is going to be saved by the hand of God 
they are taken care of. There's nobody going to be left behind who's supposed to be there. God's going to make sure he rescues every last one of his children. Okay? And so you have this concept that's being put back and forth. People always start to worry, Father, what can I end up with? I tell them, listen, stop worrying about what happens to you when your eyes close. The most important thing is for you to get in there. Make sure that you focus on living your life in such a way so that when your eyes close, when they reopen again, whether from the sleep, whether it be in the eternity, because I always tell people our problem is we believe that what we go through here is a continuation when we get there. And I tell people that's not so. If you drew a circle on a piece of paper that you have in front of you, and you put a dot in the middle of it, that dot represents you and me. Limited time, limited space, with that little dot on that paper. That ever-increasing circle represents eternity. So we have no idea when and how we're going to enter into eternity. All we know is if our lives are in Christo, in Christ, wherever he decides for us to be, I am worried. We're taken care of for all eternity. Yeah. Isn't that the reason put forth by some, by Jesus, of when he was crucified, when he went down into Chivo or the dead? Wasn't Wait. that the reason to go and to bring those? He went. Make sure you write down what Minky is trying to tell you because I did a teaching on this with a bunch of pastors in Long Island. They freaked out when, when I told them about Jesus going, the reason why when Jesus died, um, that he descended, we say in our creeds, you say it every Sunday, he descended into hell. And on the third day he rose again. Why did he go to hell? And he goes to hell in order to preach the gospel to those souls that have never heard the message before. First Peter chapter 3 and chapter 4. Make sure you write it down somewhere so you don't forget it. And so we're told that he goes to the souls. And let me say this to you all right now. Once and only once. So I don't want none of you all think... Well, I could live like a rat. <laughs> and God can come to preach to me. Lost soul like me in hell, so I could get out. Uh, it ain't gonna happen, people. He did it once and once for all. First Peter 3 and chapter 4. In fact, you need to read right straight on from chapter 3 into chapter 4 for you to be able to understand exactly what is happening. Don't worry, we're going to study, we're going to study it when we get to that particular epistle. So when our walk carries us through the New Testament. Yes, Nathan? Us, us, the the so, say it again. Between the two places. Exactly. Um, and he's talking, he's using a passage out of Luke, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, which is a parable that Jesus was telling about the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus covered with swords. Rich man didn't check for him at all. In fact, the mere fact that we are told that Lazarus was at the gate tells us that he locked Lazarus out. You see, in Jewish society, you're supposed to leave the doors and the windows open during meal times so that beggars could come in and get food. What? What? Yes. You left the doors and the windows open so that people could come and beg for something to eat.
because they had a social responsibility to look after the needy and the dejected. What's that? It was a priest only? No, it's for everybody. That was for everybody. What's that? You remember I did that with you all when we were going through St. Luke's Gospel, right? Remember that? Okay? And the problem is that it's obvious that the man never checked for Lazarus. Never. And the only time he checks for Lazarus is when he's dead and he is in torment. And that's when he wants relief. Send Lazarus that he could tip his finger in a little bit of water and touch my tongue. Okay? And the sad part about it is that he is tormented. And worst of all, he's got brothers who live in just like him. He says, I've got five brothers. Maybe if you send body somebody back from the dead, they'll listen to him. He said, send body somebody back from the dead? You all got Moses and prophets that read to you all every week, and you all ain't listening. What do you think somebody coming back from the dead can do for you? Okay? I hope that that opens your eyes a bit. You really didn't know that, Moscow? <laughs> hope you find water. <laughs> Okay? You'll get the picture, everybody. And so he goes on and he says, we don't see total subjection to those of us who are part of the household of God as yet, but we know that the whole of creation has been subject to Jesus. He's led them in a triumphal march. We saw that in 2 Corinthians as well, chapters 4 and chapter 5. We've seen it in so many other places. I've already given you the references. I'm doing this out of my head, so don't ask me to repeat it. Okay? It was fitting that God, for whom, for whom and through whom all things existed, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering for the one who sanctifies and those that are sanctified all have one father. The word sanctification, just in case some of you all don't know, means being set apart for holy use. It was used of the vessels within the temple of God. Whether they were wooden vessels, steel vessels, iron vessels, vessels of silver gold, they were set apart for God's use. And I need you to write on your paper so you could never forget it. I have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus and by the power of his Holy Spirit. So you are being set apart for sacred use by who? Thank you. You are being set apart, sanctified for use by God. And yet, Jesus is the, 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 the writer does not use it in impersonal terms. He talks about it in very personal terms. He says, for this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his what? His brothers and sisters. In other words, not vessels. You are his brothers and his sisters, i.e., you are what? Thank you. Say it loud enough, Nathan. You're what? We are family. We. In John 15, no longer do I call you friends or slaves, but I call you friends, your family. 
because you know exactly what I need done. Okay? So when people say to you, who are you? You could tell them what? Jesus is my big brother. Is right? Okay? And he's there to defend me. He's there to lift me up. He's there to watch over me. But I want you to see there's something far more deeper here that he's about to tell us at the end of chapter 2. And that's why I told you chapter 2 and chapter 4. I love it because it tells us something very important. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Again, I will put my trust in him. Again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by what? Yeah. Death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels. Who did he come to help? Sons of, Sons of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters. Make sure you underline it, verse 17. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. To make, sac make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He is able to help those who are being tested. Anybody in here being tested? That, 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 that last, that last sentence is a very powerful sentence. It is. The that's whole thing just, is. That's just, just part of, of Christianity. That, that, please use the microphone because people miss in a whole lot. Say it again. I said that last sentence, chapter, I read chapter two, is very powerful. That's the essence of Christianity. Exactly. And more importantly, people, the point is that Jesus experienced what we experience. Please make sure you write it down somewhere. His incarnation allowed him to go through what you and I go through. His incarnation, you know, people, I tell people all the time, just as we are tempted, so was he. Just as he experienced pain and hardship, so did so he did. When he was thirsty, I thirst. Hello? When he was hungry, they went to get him food. When his friend died, he wept. Hello? When he stood before the fig tree looking for something to eat, and all he saw was a bunch of leaves, what did he do? He cursed the fig tree, and the next day it withered and died. Oh my God, don't tell me you don't know that story. Where are you all being? First the dream. <laughs> hey, please give Masco the microphone. So after he cursed the tree, he took the badge and crucified it. I don't think so. It withered and died. And when the disciples came back to it, they reminded each other that that's what happened. And, and it literally is a, is a parabolic action that he carried out. Because 
it's like a whole lot of people who got plenty of fluff, but you got no fruit to show. Lot of plain, lots of fluff, but no fruit. <laughs> you, you're here sucking up all the things out of the ground. And, and there are plenty examples of that in terms of the parables that he used. Um, remember the parable of the fig tree? When he says, let's dig around the fig tree, manure it, let it go for another year, and if it bears fruit, all well and good. If it doesn't, chop the tree down. And the problem with the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree, is they planted the fig tree in the middle of a vineyard. You know, the vine is far more important than the fig. And you letting this fig tree suck up all the nutrients out of the ground in the most advantageous spot. Of course, the fruit from the vine was far more important than the fig. <laughs> the fruit of the vine. Okay. Oh, I'm not worried. See, see, at the men's retreat, I told them over and over again. Uh, I told them, I told them about Ephesians chapter five, where it says. Do not be filled with wine, but be filled constantly with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So I got no problems here. We, we, we saw, as far as I'm concerned, that was God's word. That is put the end to that. Okay? But I can tell you this much. Most Bahamian people would not survive in a Jewish culture because they had wine at every meal, every festival, every feast. Okay? And so, yeah, but the thing is that they treated it as something sacred. It was not just moderation. They, they made sure they limited what people did because they thought it a sin from the pages of the Old Testament to be intoxicated. Huh? I don't know about to drink it till you're not drunk, Dennis. What is that? You'd probably be modified in terms of you would need an embalming fluid from if you drink like that. All right, but basically, from the first two chapters, you already get a feel for what the author is trying to do. He's counteracting a whole lot of the false teaching that is taking place in this community of faith. Those who want to make Jesus less than God, those who want to treat him like he's a glorified angel, those who want to make sure that they don't want to obey what is being said in the gospel tradition, those who do not want to pay attention to what is being preached in the gospel tradition, and those who understand God's purpose of sending his son to redeem us so that we could come out and be the head rather than the tail. And in case some of you all ain't figured that one out yet, uh, keep up with the head end. You don't want to be near the tail. Amen. That's it for the night. Okay, no need to look at me strangely. That you know it comes at the tail end. Yeah, we can pray. We can pray. We can pray for greater insight and greater reading. No, 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 no. Let us pray. Father in heaven, when we face trials, difficulties, when life around us is trying to preach a different gospel 
and a different message to us. Keep us alert. Keep us faithful. Keep us steadfast. Help us to make sure that we remain dedicated to you, Lord Jesus. For you are the only real thing we have in this night. Everything else will fade and perish. But you remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us to battle on. And above all, help us to make sure that we exercise true belief and right conduct so that our lives may be rooted, grounded, and grafted in you at every turn and step along the way. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now please go home and do some extra reading because I'm a little surprised that y'all don't know about some of these stories about Jesus cursing the fig tree and all the rest of it.